guys, today we are doing race car things. We're going to be getting with Johan and Owen who have been wrenching and fabbing away at the E36 competition car. Uh, if you haven't seen any of the other videos, this car is destined for Europe. It's going to be over there as my Europe competition car. And because it's getting shipped overseas, we're building and doing a lot of things different. We're also taking a lot of knowledge that we've learned from the other E36 to make this the best car we've ever built. I guess to start off, just to answer a common question I get, why are you building an E36 like this? Pretty simple, really. Older cars, they have thinner metal, so they're lighter. The power plant for this car is gonna be very similar to what I use in my blue E36, which is around mid 800s for horsepower. Now, that should be enough for competition. It's a lot easier for me to mentally take away weight than it is to add more power and potentially make an engine and drivetrain program that I know is reliable uh, potentially make unreliable by upping the power. So lightweight, easier on the gear, um, and obviously it makes the car faster without having to add power. It's lighter, and then also having economies of scale, being able to use the same parts between the cars. If something fails, very similar things can be taken in exchange between the cars, subframes, arms, even drivetrain components, possibly even some of the fabricated exhaust stuff. Uh, it'll just be a lot easier to have two of the same car versus different ones. E46 also shares a lot of the same ones, um, but I think uh, I'm just a little bit more of an E36 guy than an E46 guy. So that's your why, and now we're gonna dig into some of the details and a lot of the new stuff since the last update uh, to kind of bring you guys up to speed. Another thing you'll see as we go through this car is it's incredibly simple. Um, because of the fact this car is going over to Europe and we don't know who is going to be running it with me at every event it goes to, making this car extremely serviceable, extremely simple, uh, is a very core focus throughout the build. Looking at the engine bay, uh, nothing is wildly, drastically different from any other E36. I think the biggest thing compared to my other car is that we stitch welded um, quite a few areas around here and then these bars were added uh, because this cutout area makes it a lot more serviceable if you have to make a change to a tie rod, anything going on with suspension, you can see what's going on. But obviously when you cut away this metal, it's good to strengthen it back up. Another real cool thing is this PWR custom intercooler we had made. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a second, um, but obviously you can tell the radiator is no longer here. Not only does moving it in the back rule out the possibility of any punctures if I get a little greedy and give someone a bop, um, but it also moves weight more to the rear. Uh, as much as I would like to run an SR in this thing, like I said, it's the same power plant as a blue E36. Jay-Z's are heavy. They're not by any means, uh, I don't wanna say they're not a great engine. They're just, they're just old and heavy and iron and uh, they put a lot of weight on the front of the car. So wanna move it back, try to get the weight uh, balance as good as we can. Freeing up space allows us to run the intercool a little bit farther back. And then, uh, yeah, this is a special unit, I'll show you. You guys got a high horsepower car, you know intercoolers can be pretty heavy. I met with PWR at both PRI and SEMA and I just talked to him I was like, yo, could you build me the lightest intercooler possible? So this intercooler, as big as it is, supporting a thousand plus horsepower, put it on the scales and it weighs half of what my old intercooler weighed, which was like half the size. So 18 pounds for this giant monstrosity. The way they do this, what I was told is it's essentially a special brazing process and then the fact that they have years of fabricating experience um, helps get it this lightweight. It also has louvered air fins and an internal tubulator that helps with heat exchange. And as you can see, it was custom made exactly for our application. Johan basically made a sketch on a napkin, sent it over, and the same guys that make intercoolers and radiators for F1, NASCAR, IndyCar, made a really badass unit for my E36, so I'm happy. I can't remember if I discussed this when we were talking about the body kit on the car originally. I was not a fan of the HGK front bumper. It's like a little bit too DTM race car for me. However, as we started kind of conceptualizing the build, using a stock bumper like I wanted would have required us making these uh, side pieces to make it flow with the fenders. And then we would still need to run the front nose cone, which is heavy, annoying, and many pieces. This provides a really nice solution because it's all one piece. Obviously it's carbon Kevlar, but there's not a lot of stuff to move around, get pushed, broken, et cetera. The biggest thing for me is just the openings on the bumper look weird. So what we're gonna try to do is enlarge in this opening um, to make it look a little bit more like a factory bumper and then probably do the same on these because I think there's just so much blank space 
uh, even though it makes sense for what it's designed for. I think Kristaps said this was actually designed for an actual like road race car at the time and then repurposed for drift cars. So that would make sense with like the ducting and everything. But for what we're doing, it's not as necessary. And I just really want it to look cool. I'm gonna make stickers to make it look like I have headlights. We got like headlight blanks here too, since we don't need to run headlights. That's so cool to me. Um, you notice too, we, we cut here. I really didn't like how the fenders like kind of bowed out and looked real almost, um, I don't wanna say like, like Liberty Walk as like a derogatory thing, but it looked like very like Stan's car having the fender bow out. I like it when the fenders kind of have like a lip here, almost like the new GT3 RS. So we have here our very first in-house carbon piece. Josh was basically given the challenge, fiberglass poppy, to figure out how to lay carbon. So this is one of the very first things that he made. Uh, he still wants to get it better, and this is like literally the, the start of something maybe much bigger. Um, but this was one of his first pieces, and what this will basically do is replace what used to go here that was stock, and then kind of flow in with this fender rather before it like, I wish I had the old piece to show you. We'll put a, a clip up of what it looked like before, but it just came out really far and I think it would have also possibly caused an issue with wheel clearance where this is kind of radius back quite a bit farther. There's a couple different processes for making carbon. This would be considered a wet lay. Uh, there's a lot of different processes, um, but this is probably the best like entry level thing to learn how to start working with carbon, but who knows, we could see the carbon department of LZMFG become the carbon department. <laughs> this is your mid-video reminder that we are giving away this Baller Podium One Ultimate Simulator valued at over $50,000 and $15,000 cash. All you gotta do is support the channel by buying a shirt, hat, anything from lzmfg.com or drifted2.com is gonna get you entered for a chance to win. One of my favorite things on this, uh, the past day or two, I've spent a little bit of time playing dirt. Uh, since my new uh, dream is to be a rally car driver, it allows me to do that without having to total my GTR learning how to drive in trees and jump. So I'll show you exactly what we wouldn't want to do in the Safari GTR as I try not to crash. <laughs> hey, Michael. Ready. Flat left, 50, two, six right to crest, six left, 50, flat middle of crests, 18. Really good. This is really <laughs> exhilarating. It's really fun. I'm starting to learn how the like little commands go. I will comment below if you want to see me get in an actual rally car because it's something I think I actually want to do. GTR is like cool and all, but like I want to go in a real rally car. Engine package, I guess one difference is we are going to experiment and see kind of what the differences, gains, or losses are with going from a stock intake manifold to a plasma man plenum. Typically when you go to like a bigger plenum, you'll lose a little bit of torque in exchange for top end power. But the idea is by doing this, it makes everything a little bit more uh, simple, serviceable. We do have to get rid of a brake booster, which is a pro and a con. I've kind of gotten used to it on the other car, but we're gonna try it, see how it uh, feels, and everything is technically reversible to where if we wanted to go to stock intake manifold and go back to a brake booster, we have that option and we know that it works on the other car. I said that it's the same power package as the other car to make it really, really simple. Essentially, we got a BC crank, 3.4 uh, BC cams, internals. It's essentially a BC 3.4 stroker kit. Nothing super fancy. It is a CNC ported head, but in terms of 2J stuff and a lot of the wild things that you can do, it's really simple. Not a dry sump. Thankfully, on E36s, it's rear sump, so you don't need to really worry about that. So yeah, just a really, really simple 2JZ package targeting like mid 800s for power. I'm gonna Johan take lead to kind of talk through some of the middle of the car, um, but one thing you will notice, the trans tunnel on these cars, we don't need to modify. I'll be running a G-Force uh, four-speed dog box my favorite transmission ever. Literally, we figured out what works in the E36 uh, and clutch kickers. Never skipped a beat, very, very little maintenance, never missed a gear. Sequentials are cool, but four speed's all that's really necessary for drifting, so we're going with the same setup and very, very little mo modifications necessary. This plate is more for serviceability than like needing clearance for actual trans stuff, but um, I'll let Johan kind of talk to you about some of the stuff he's been fabbing up on the inside. So what we have done with the um, radium fuel cell is 
enclose it in an aluminum case, mainly because we won't have a firewall behind the main hoop, so we had to enclose the, the fuel tank. It's in several different pieces. This is so that the fire sleeve go, goes over the fuel neck so that it's inside a enclosed compartment. And then this comes off like this. And then inside we have the radium uh, cell. Here, this thing you see here, there's a hole in there. And that's where the lines would go through for the return and feed. So this is the enclosure. We'll use some foam around the, the flanges where it's gonna seal. And then it's independent from this piece. So it's good, you don't have to like weld anything together. We got all the electrical here, so we will make a bulkhead for the, the case so that it connects to, and it seals in everything in the fuel compartment. As you know, one of the other, I'd say, interesting things on my other E36 is that I kept a factory fuel tank, and we were considering doing the same on this, but we did run into some issues with fuel slosh, uh, other wiring things and gremlins that you can have with a stock tank. Because this is a pure competition car, you essentially refuel after every two laps. So it's okay to go down to a little bit smaller cell. But the biggest thing here is rather than putting a fuel cell in the rear, which a lot of people do, I wanted to keep the weight as forward as possible because you start to get a pendulum, almost like rear engine effect when you put too much of the weight behind the rear axle. So it's cool that we were able to put it here. Um, Chelsea, I got to give a shout out to, this is kind of like his go-to spot and he really um, pushed us in this direction. It's something I wanted to do already anyway. Um, but uh, usually I'm hesitant to just because of the fact that you lose a little bit of fuel capacity. With the radium setup though, their internal surge tank, you don't really need to worry. You could essentially run this thing bone dry until you run out of fuel. We're not gonna do that, um, but their surge tank setup is next to none. The quality of everything you make is really good and um, it should look sick when it's all said and done. As you noticed, um, the radiator is no longer in the front. We decided to move it to the back. Again, like what Adam said with the um, weight and then crash. Um, so in the front is limited to piercing the radiator and then being a close call where we will make it back out. So with the radiator in the back, that means we have two lines going to the back of the car. Under the chassis, I decided to cut away in this section uh, of the chassis where the lines would stay fully flat through the whole way down. So I don't have to do any bends to them. Um, there will be just aluminum tubing that runs through here. And then right behind here, there'll be uh, two connections, AN connections where one will go to the pump and then the other one is coming from the radiator. And then the pump is right here. Everything mounts there and everything is accessible. Everything is just uh, being able to service easily. If you gotta remove the lines, so it'll be, you know, two mounting hardware, the four um, connections, the line comes off the same for the pump. Everything is pretty straightforward so that we could work on it as efficient as we can. From there, the lines will come up through here. Um, there will be a bulkhead uh, with some electrical connections and plumbing for the coolant. Then the coolant will go through the firewall down here. There'll be two bulkheads there to route the lines through the firewall and get them to their locations, which is on this side right here. There'll be dash 16 lines. There's plenty of space in here for that. And then we have a bleed out for the radium universal cash can, cooling cash can. And that will go somewhere around here. And then that just helps with getting all the air out of the system and it bleeds out into the swirl pot. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. One other thing that you can't see going on here, if you look kind of down in this crevice, I actually have a photo of Johan underneath the car. We have the car in a rotisserie and uh, using my old E36 and all the places where the chassis continually cracked as kind of a guide, Johan uh, was able to weld up a lot of areas and kind of strengthen um, potential weak points of the car. Uh, one other thing too, talking about adding fuel, you'll see over here in this uh, quarter window, this is Radium's dry brake. You can refill a car in what, like, I feel like it's like three seconds. Yeah, the, I mean, the, this, it's pretty fast. The 36 with the stock tank, it bent out pretty well, so that means it sucked all the fuel, fuel in pretty fast. So this, it should be even better. So I think the E36 took us like what? 10 seconds, fully empty to like five gallons in. Yeah. So that's good for a stock system. What helps is the bleeder on the uh, stock tank is the re required size for the tank to vent out. So it allows for the air to escape and the fuel to come in. If you have a smaller hole, the smaller it will take to 
for the fuel to go into the tank. One other cool thing, uh, same windows that we use in all the other cars, these are from Plastics for Performance over in the UK. Uh, not only is their stuff like literally made to direct fit onto the cars, but it also has all the factory um, like black and like paint and stuff, so you don't need to do it yourself. This stuff's super durable, it doesn't really scratch, they offer like anti-fog coatings and stuff. Um, but I'm stoked more than anything, we're still gonna have somewhat of a rear window. I hate when you have no rear window whatsoever when the firewall comes all the way up. I guess it's more so for like just not running over people in the pits. Yeah. Cause like, it, yeah. it sounds ridiculous, but when you're in, you're in your helmet and like especially if you have a Hans and you have like a halo seat, it's hard to see or like look around. Um, so it's nice to be able to have something. You Especially know. with kids, it's really stressful backing up the car and kids are excited so they're not thinking to move, but you can't see them. So yeah, nerve wracking. Everything. It's funny, a, a couple pro cars, again, this car's gonna be simple, so we're not gonna add it to this one, but I've seen a couple pro cars where they actually have like the rear view mirrors that have a backup camera. Yeah. And they have a backup camera on the drift car. <laughs> That's pretty cool, unnecessary yeah. for us. But this is really cool too. This is uh, another thing that HGK makes. Uh, cool solution for the fan shroud, just like a nice carbon piece instead of having to make something out of aluminum. Yeah, we're, we will be running brushless setup on this car and wired through the um, Racer PDMs uh, and controlled by that. Pretty st simple, straightforward. They give you the whole shroud uncut so that the fans fit to size. Like you get the fans, you mark everything up, you cut it and everything is perfect for the fans that you decide to run with. And it's lightweight and it, you could set it in two different configurations and you know this one will just blow out there'll be holes on the trunk so all the all the air hot air will get escaped the trunk like i said owen's been wrenching on this car real hard too he's been a large part of a lot of the fabrication process on the car and i'm gonna let him kind of fill you guys in on this rear crash structure and kind of the whole idea behind it so we cut the frame rails off here and we got this box tubing out here so if it's in a crash and it gets to this point it's out this far, so it won't actually get into the car. We also have a jack point down here. We'll have a tow, tow hook back here too. There's like a, a threaded bung right here. That'll have the, the tow hook on it as well. Then the bash bar, it's kind of modeled after um, RTR's bash bars. Uh, after seeing them, you know, get- Crashed a lot. <laughs> crashed a lot by Adam and Chelsea and Vaughn. So designed it after that. The um, These bars are like a little bit thinner. So when they hit, they'll, in theory, this will bend and give before anything else in this structure. We designed these plates. This, the part that's welded into the chassis is like has threaded inserts that Johan welded the backside of. And then this plate is that exact same plate, just thinner uh, with the same holes. So it bolts right into the inserts. It makes it easy to like unbolt them and it's easy to like make them again if you have the plates that are like consistent and everything. So it's easy yeah. to like jig them up and everything. Uh, Johan told me how to use the bender. So it's my first time actually using it. It's my first time like welding something that was like structural, like it's actually gonna get hit and stuff. So it'll be fun to Looks really good. see. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> it'll probably be the one one scenario where Owen will be excited when I crash the car. Cause he'll be like, did it hold up? <laughs> did it, is it good? Is it legit? I'm sure it will. It looks really good. So um, no, it came out super cool. I guess the uh, the other main thing to kind of talk about with this car, obviously it's not the prettiest form right now. We're waiting on the roof and a couple other little things to get all the final metal work done. And then the chassis is gonna go off to powder coat. I see a lot of people kind of debate and talk back and forth about, you know, is it better to paint a car, is it better to powder coat? The painter's argument is it's usually a little bit more accessible if you don't have a place that can dip or sandblast or get a car prepped for powder coat. Also, they say, oh, well, you know, if you have to repair something, then it's harder to touch a powder coat. We powder coated the S15 and that build has lasted, I don't know what it is, five or six years now. And the powder coat still looks brand new. It's extremely durable um, and it still looks amazing. So thought process with this is do the same thing. We had touch up cans made in paint to match the powder coat on the other car. So that way if there is something that's damaged or something you need to repair, uh, yeah, you'll have a few areas of the car that are painted versus powder coated, but it's the difference between the car lasting 10, 15 years before needing to get redone versus painted cars. I feel like you got to repaint everything like almost once every two or three years. So uh, more of a longevity thing and I think it's gonna look really good. That's pretty much it for this. I wanna give you guys an update. The guys have been busting ass in the background and the car's come a long way since you've last seen it. In other news, the 964 will probably have a video out sometime next week. Uh, just been doing some maintenance stuff, getting it ready for its first road trip. And then the Safari GTR, we finally got some parts in that we've been waiting for. Even longer travel shocks from BC. Uh, rear diff should be coming in any day now. And then that car is essentially next step of performance we'll be able to test. So uh, that's it for this video. Hope you guys are excited and uh, more details to come. When you say
Oh, we'll stop the clip here. We'll stop the clip here.